We don't have the final plans yet, but it's not unreasonable to think that we're going to put 100,000 square feet or more of new hangars down. We're going to be putting some operation centers and offices and perhaps some laboratories for integration of new sensors in at Grand Sky. I have every reason to expect we may double in size in terms of total square footage developed. You're listening to the Drone Radio Show podcast, the show about drones and the people who use them for business, fun and research. Hosted by Randy Goers. Hello, everyone. This is Randy Goers and welcome to the Drone Radio Show podcast, episode 372. Can drones really foster economic development? For that question, we head to Grand Forks, North Dakota, to speak with Tom Swoyer, president of the Grand Sky Development Company. Grand Sky is the first and only fully operational commercial UAV research and development park in the United States. Strategically located on the Grand Forks Air Force Base in North Dakota, Grand Sky is the hub of activities in the nation's leading state for UAS flight testing, training, and development. Since 2015, Grand Sky has been the site of continuous UAS industry advancements and milestones. Not only that, the investments in UAS at Grand Sky are now producing dividends in terms of new private development, jobs, and tax revenues. In addition to being president of Grand Sky, Tom is also the founder. He developed a master plan for the design, construction, and operation of the infrastructure and facilities for Grand Sky. He has also worked alongside a litany of key stakeholders and partners, including the Air Force, the state of North Dakota, congressional delegations, and Grand Forks County in making Grand Sky a success. In this episode of the Drone Radio Show, Tom talks about Grand Sky, its UAS mission and vision, and how the investments that have been made are yielding jobs, development, and increasing the tax base, thus proving UAS can provide community-wide benefits. But first, if you like my podcast, I invite you to join the community of Drone Radio Show Advocates. As a Drone Radio Show Advocate, you'll be able to talk about current shows, bounce around ideas for future episodes, suggest questions of upcoming guests, Basically, help make the show better and get the content that you're looking for. It's also a great way to support the show. To become a Drone Radio Show advocate, go to patreon.com slash drone radio show. And by the way, if you have a great story on the use of drones that you'd like to share in a podcast, contact me at randy at droneradioshow.com. So let's learn about the potential economic benefits of UAS with Tom Swoyer of Grand Sky Development Company. Let's pick up the interview where I asked Tom to introduce himself. My name is Tom Swoyer. I am the president of Grand Sky Development Company in Grand Forks, North Dakota. I uh, am responsible at Grand Sky for the broad development planning um, and development vision for the air park as well as securing financing and tenant agreements, as well as other agreements for companies that want to fly uh, aircraft at Grand Sky, as well as bringing together all the different aspects of what a uh, drone air park would need from um, the amenities that that companies want, that companies need to fly, to the agreements that we have to use the Air Force Base runway that we're right next to, Um, and all the other developmental agreements that are required to let us build buildings, fly aircraft, and support all of that. So that's kind of what I do on a regular basis. Now, the name of the organization includes the word development. Does that mean Grand Sky is primarily a physical development organization, or do you get involved in the airspace planning as well? The core business is predicated on developing the land that we have leased from Grand Forks County, who in turn have leased the land from United States Air Force. And so our job is to develop the facilities on the ground, but also 
In order for that to work, we have by necessity been involved with developing the airspace and access to airspace elements of Grand Sky, of UAS flight. So, for example, there are two primary agreements that allow us, our, our park, to function. The first is a ground lease. Our lease is with Grand Forks County, and Grand Forks County has the lease with the Air Force. And that may sound complicated, but it's a great partnership between the three organizations. And that gives us the permission to install infrastructure, to develop facilities, um, and use that land. Then there is a uh, document called a joint use agreement, and ours is relatively unique in the Department of Defense. And that joint use agreement allows Grand Sky and our tenants to use the Air Force Base runway to get support from the Air Force Tower, to get support from their emergency services when needed, if there were to be a mishap. And basically, it allows us to fly using their assets. And that's a really important document to have. It's an important capability to have. And that document is unique in the DOD in that it allows military and civilian aircraft manned and unmanned to fly from the Grand Forks Air Force Base runway. Small UAS, large UAS. Um, right now, our largest operator, General Atomics, flies company-owned MQ-9 Reapers under a civilian COA from Grand Forks Air Force Base runway, the Air Force Base runway, but they're located on Grand Sky and they do it every day. Um, they fly beyond line of sight. So we've been actively involved in all of the elements that allow beyond line of sight flights from Grand Sky. How many acres is Grand Sky? Uh, it's relatively small. It's only 217 acres, but by virtue of the joint use agreement, the Air Force shares their primary and secondary radar feed with us. And then we can then in turn share it with companies like General Atomics on Grand Sky. And that gives them access to 5,600 square miles of beyond line of sight area that they can fly over. So while the Grand Sky is only a couple hundred acres, the area that we can operate in is quite large. How much is already developed? We're just approaching about the midway mark here. Uh, in fact, what we'll talk about here shortly, the Test Resource Management Center and their decision to locate at Grand Sky will probably take us up to the 50% mark. We've used up all of our space that has access to the runway. So we've got to build some new taxiways and some new ramps here in the coming year so that we can expand that opportunity. But we're basically filled up already for all that. Wow, that's exciting. What was the genesis for Grand Sky? The history and the genesis of Grand Sky dates back to October of 2011. And it was developed kind of in a complementary way to the test site, but completely independent of each other. Absolutely developed independent of each other. And the community, the greater Grand Forks community, really wanted to figure out a way to make an investment in the Air Force Base there. They really wanted to say, hey, how can we as a community make an investment in the Air Force Base such that the Air Force is better off being here in Grand Forks than being somewhere else with this mission? And at the time, the mission was the RQ-4 Global Hawk uh, was coming in. Uh, the Block 40 Global Hawk program was moving to Grand Forks Air Force Base. They were setting up shop at that time in 2010, 2011. And it became abundantly clear very quickly that the stars were aligning in Grand Forks in that the Air Force was bringing in a uh, unmanned aircraft mission, an uncrewed aircraft mission. The University of North Dakota was setting up a um, UAS degree program. The test site applications were going in at that point in time and being produced at that point in time. And so there was a lot of unmanned aircraft activity in the community. And we, my partners and I seized on the opportunity that, hey, you know, the future of aviation is going to be around this. Why don't we as a community make the investment around uncrewed aircraft systems, large UAS, in particular, large UAS, because there are a number of large companies that want a place to be able to fly their aircraft. And most of their aircraft are in support of military missions. So why not take advantage of that and create this opportunity? And that was the genesis of Grand Sky in 2011, 2012. And that took us until uh, February of 2015 before we could actually sign the agreements 
with the Air Force and the county to actually begin development of it. But more directly to your question, as a planner, speaking to you as a planner, it's very organic. And what we had to work with was a 17-acre former uh, alert ramp, 17 acres of concrete that had previously been disconnected from the runway. And so we asked the state for some support to be able to reconnect that. That was, you know, 3,000 yards of concrete to make that connection back. But once that connection was made, now we were in business to be able to access the runway. Now it made sense for companies to locate here because while we're leasing land from the Air Force, we have our own separate security and our own separate access. So it's all the benefits of being on base without having to go through base security and some of the base rules to get out there and operate. So it's really kind of the best of the civilian and military worlds. Were the utilities already in place or did Grand Sky have to construct those facilities? That had to be developed as well. We had to bring everything out to that site. It, other than the former alert ramp, which had some utilities connected back to the base, and the Air Force preferred that we have our own utility system instead of drawing from the base, we had to bring 15 miles of water, sewer, electricity, fiber optics, natural gas. We had to build all the roads. We had to install the new security perimeters. Everything had to be brought out there. And thanks to the generosity of the state of North Dakota, who recognized that this was an incredible opportunity, they had uh, granted us a lot of that money to build all of that infrastructure at Grand Sky. Overall, how is the program funded? Right now, the state of North Dakota has invested in all of the ground infrastructure, so all the utilities, the roads, security, aircraft, pavements, ramps and aprons and things like that. And the private sector has invested in all the facilities that are going up. So to give you a sense, the state has invested just about $28 million in infrastructure, and the private sector has invested about $90 million in facilities. And that doesn't include equipment, furniture, planes, or anything like that. That's just kind of a brick for brick comparison from infrastructure and facilities. The city planner in me wants to know if the land is generating tax dollars. So the land is still owned by the Air Force. So as a federal installation, the land itself cannot be taxed. But once a building is built, the leasehold interest in the buildings can be taxed. So once an improvement is made there, then the county can tax that. So they are generating some tax revenue from it. But the county has taken the position to have a relatively light touch and just taxing the building value and such. So that's great, but the county is getting that. The county also, the whole region benefits from employment. Roughly 200 people work at Grand Sky every day. Right now, we expect that number to jump uh, considerably in the coming year or two. But 200 or so people work at Grand Sky every day with an average salary of $90,000 a year. And we generate about $1.3 million a year in tax revenue right now that number is about to go up. So, and that's just in state and local taxes. So the federal taxes would be on top. Yeah. I was going to ask about the economic impact. It sounds pretty exciting. As the test site became more operational, how has that changed the dynamics at Grand Sky? The Northern Plains Test Site Authority, which is a state agency, And Grand Sky, which is a private for-profit entity, my company, Grand Sky Development Company, that owns Grand Sky, we work very closely together. We have a fabulous partnership. We work with each other constantly on projects. The test site has projects that involve DOD and NASA from time to time that they do that work at Grand Sky because it's a little easier for them. We need help from time to time accessing airspace and working with companies that want to fly at Grand Sky and getting COAs to be able to fly and use our beyond line of sight system. I mean, it's a very uh, symbiotic and mutually supporting relationship. I I couldn't be happier or speak more highly of our relationship with the test site. It's really good. In fact, we're constantly in touch many days each week uh, at all levels of our organization. So uh, we're pretty excited about that relationship. So while they operate and they do their things and have separate funding, we work very closely together on multiple projects. Does the airspace for the Vantis program include the Grand Sky area? Will you be able to take advantage of the demonstration project? Yes, we certainly will. Vantis, actually their mission network operating center, their MNOC, 
is actually located on Grand Sky. For a variety of reasons, they located there, you know, security, access to some big users in Northrop Grumman and General Atomics, access to other users that want to be at Grand Sky. And so the test site actually helped us build the Grand Sky Beyond Line of Sight system. We get that radar feed, the primary and secondary radar feed from the Air Force. We combine that with a situational awareness, a software package, and that gives our tenants the ability to then fly beyond line of sight. That formed the version one of what Vantis is going to become. Now, Vantis is far more sophisticated using radars and using radios all over the state. Our system is situational awareness only, airspace awareness only, where Vantis will also provide a command and control, a C2 function, in addition to situational awareness of the airspace. But they, it got its genesis, the concept got its genesis from Grand Sky, and now they're going to deploy across the state which is fantastic for customers who are located at Grand Sky because they will be able to ultimately seamlessly fly from our BV loss system into the Vantis system across the state at almost any altitude. And it'll be just massively advantageous and cost-effective for companies to be able to fly beyond line of sight across the entire state. Well, that's all very exciting to me, especially the economic development aspects. Well, you know, Randy, when we talk about some of the economic development, Randy, I, I can say that Grand Sky, you know, we plotted it out, we planned roads, and it's growing very organically. It's growing quickly. We are ahead of what we thought our development pace would be. We're in rural Grand Forks County, North Dakota, 15 miles outside of town on the Air Force Base. We thought it would take a little bit longer, but the ability to fly beyond line of sight, the amenities that we've had. And to your point, it's not just a real estate deal. We have really had to dig into and really understand what are the requirements needed to support UAS operations and not just research and development, which are very important, but day-to-day -day operations, be that training on sensors, be it operations uh, to support agriculture or oil and gas or things like that. We had to build those capabilities to bring that tool set to Grand Sky so that people could come in, set up, and be flying very quickly. And that's something we pride ourselves on. Okay, so let's talk about what's happening today. First of all, what assets or facilities are already in place? We have all of the kind of assets that we would need to have, you know, almost airport type assets minus the FBO, but we have airport type assets to launch and recover aircraft from a 12,000 foot runway. And we have a more traditional business park with buildings that are not airfield related um, and companies that are kind of doing training, put simulators in and things like that. Plus the Vantis MNOC is there. And while that's supporting flight, it's not directly itself a flight related activity. What is Sky Range and how does it relate to Grand Sky? Sky Range is a program managed by the Test Resource Management Center. TRMC is how we'll refer to them going forward. And TRMC is a organization within the Department of Defense. They have sister organizations of DARPA, the Missile Defense Agency, Space Development Agency, TRMC. They're all part of the Department of Defense. And Sky Range is an effort to develop a capability to create a testing capability for TRMC that acts as a range. And right now, TRMC needs to test on behalf of DOD hypersonic missiles. And we can dig into what the hypersonic missiles are, but they fly high, they fly fast, and they are a emerging threat to the United States military. And TRMC has been tagged with the responsibility of testing and evaluating and understanding more uh, about our capabilities and our understanding our adversaries' capabilities. And the problem with it is that because of their altitude, because of their speed, to have a test range in a traditional sense, a place where you can fly things and test things, is very difficult to develop because of their speed and range and the capabilities of the missiles. So TRMC came up with the idea to develop a sky range. And what that is, is they are going to take former Air Force Global Hawk aircraft and convert them from aircraft that look down to aircraft that start looking up. 
And they will start looking up and they will be able to move those aircraft anywhere in the world, they almost anywhere in the world they need them to be. They can stay on station for quite some time and they can then evaluate and monitor hypersonic missile tests. And so they call it sky range because it's a range. We're creating a mesh networked group of aircraft that can set up almost anywhere, say, for example, over the Western Pacific Ocean, and they can watch hypersonic missile tests and they're doing it from the sky, hence the name sky range. And so the test resource management center within the Department of Defense manages that program. Do you know the extent of the monitoring to be done by the Global Hawks? They expect to monitor from launch to termination. I think they're expecting to monitor the high-speed aspects of it. They're going to conduct research and development on the hypersonic missiles and, and try to understand not only what our capabilities and develop our capabilities to a higher level, but also watch our adversaries' capabilities as well. So that's kind of the extent of my knowledge. I know that they are planning to use the Global Hawks because of their ability to carry pretty powerful payloads, power them, and stay on station for considerable lengths of time. So the Global Hawk becomes a great aircraft, a great platform to manage that. It also reduces their cost of operations. My understanding right now is the way this works is the Navy out of, say, um, Hawaii sends a bunch of ships out and then they conduct a test and those ships monitor that test from wherever they are. But that creates an opportunity for our adversaries to know that the tests are going on. It's expensive to move all those tests out. You can't keep testing for a while with them out there. They go out, they come back, and it takes a little while to refit the ships to be able to go back out again, whereas the Global Hawks will be able to come and go with a higher frequency. So it'll reduce testing costs and improve testing volume. So the more tests we'll be able to do. How did the transfer of the Global Hawks come about? The Block 20 Global Hawk program was terminated, I believe it was last year or the year before. And those aircraft were brought over to Grand Sky in anticipation of being a part of the Sky Range program. More recently, this fiscal year, the Block 30 Global Hawk program, which includes about 20, 21 aircraft, was also shut down by the Air Force. And the Air Force is making strategic changes to d- use different ISR assets, and that's great. But the Block 30 still had a lot of useful life left in them. And so the Air Force made a decision to work with TRMC, and TRMC said, we want all these Block 30 aircraft plus the Block 20s we already have, and we want to uh, use them for the Sky Range program. And the decision was made, well, okay, but we need to get these planes out of our bases because they're taking up a lot of room in our hangars and we need to put other things in there. And so they kind of looked around and said, well, where can we do it? And we raised our hand and said, Grand Sky can take all of them. We have more than enough room to park all of them if you're willing to let them be parked outside until such time as enough hangars are built. But we said, we can take them all. We can get them here safely. Uh, fly them all to Grand Forks Air Force Base, and let's drive them over to Grand Sky. And so that's what's happened. So the first five Block 30s are now at Grand Sky, plus four Block 20s. So we have nine Global Hawks over on Grand Sky right now, and we should have all the rest by the end of the month. And all of those Global Hawks will be converted for use by Sky Range. Yes, that's the plan. The pace with which they are converted, I think, is still to be decided. And we expect that conversion work to happen at Grand Sky. So um, one after another, they'll start rolling into a maintenance hangar, a modification hangar, and get modified and roll out to a long-term storage hangar that we're going to construct. So this will be a uh, really great program to modernize all those aircraft to support the new Sky Range mission. In the meantime, this is what Grand Sky was kind of built Four, Sky Range didn't exist, obviously, when we started the Grand Sky program. We started developing the park, but we always knew that it would be able to handle a large-scale program like this. So we're really glad that we uh, had the foresight to build the infrastructure in such a way that it could support a Global Hawk modernization program. There's not too many places in the country that can support that. So the planes will be able to do engine tests. They'll be able to fly off. They'll be able to do testing work to make sure they're they're flying properly. They'll land. They can be stored. They can be maintained properly. 
And we've got the infrastructure from not only the physical infrastructure, but also the labor infrastructure in Grand Forks to be able to support that since Grand Forks Air Force Base already supports the RQ-4 mission. So we've got a lot of things going for us to be able to really cost effectively help the Department of Defense, specifically the Test Resource Management Center, cost effectively operate the Sky Range program. Did the Air Force transfer any resources as well, either for maintenance or support of the Global Hawks? No, right now it's um, just transferring ownership of the planes to TRMC. I suppose somewhere in the future, the Air Force and TRMC may start to collaborate more closely. But for right now, I mean, it's really just a, we need to clear the hangars out. Grand Sky, can you take these planes? Once they're over there, we'll figure out what the path forward is on getting them all modernized. So for right now, it was really just an exercise in getting the planes organized and getting them over to Grand Sky, which we're in the process of doing. We've mentioned the Test Resource Management Center a couple of times. Can you give us more detail on what it is and its role? The Test Resource Management Center is a, like I said before, is a Department of Defense agency, and they are tasked with the singular responsibility of making sure that the United States Department of Defense, all the services, all the branches, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, have test ranges, test programs, um, research programs to make sure that the United States military is technologically superior to all of our adversaries. And so how we test, how we train, how we manage the locations where we test and train is what the Test Resource Management Center is all about. They also take on responsibilities that are joint service. So risks or uh, issues that affect multiple services like hypersonic missiles, TRMC gets tapped to kind of manage that for all the services evenly. So they have the ability to kind of tap all of the resources of all the services. And they also provide some oversight to the services to make sure that, for example, maybe the Yuma Proving Ground or the China Lake Naval Weapons Station have the resources they need to be able to conduct their specific tests and their specific training activities. So that's what TRMC does. They're, they're not very high profile. They're not a very huge organization, but they have a pretty important role in making sure our military is at the cutting edge of everything they do. And am I correct that their sphere of operation is worldwide, not just North Dakota? Correct. It, worldwide. Any, any U.S. military asset that's involved in testing, training, development, TRMC probably has a hand with them. There really is a lot going on at Grand Sky. What are some of the underlying reasons for the success? Our job primarily at Grand Sky is to create the infrastructure and amenity resources like a beyond line of sight system that other organizations can use to create the desirability to locate at Grand Sky. And so we're not personally Grand Sky operating the Global Hawks. We're doing some UAS related work ourselves. But for the most part, our job is to create the environment that people want to come fly unmanned aircraft uh, from Grand Sky. It's create that environment. And that's what we do. So right now, we have two big tenants that are already there, General Atomics and Northrop Grumman. Um, Northrop Grumman, as the builder of the Global Hawk originally, I'm sure will have a very large role in this TRMC program that will cause them to expand fairly significantly at Grand Sky. I don't know what that expansion means yet. I don't know how much, but if I had to guess, I'd say we're talking about dozens more jobs at a minimum that are going to be coming to Grand Sky because of this. And then we have a great relationship and another tenant in General Atomics, and they fly MQ-9 aircraft from Grand Sky. They're expanding. Um, they're building another hangar to be able to handle more aircraft and conduct more flight training. They do sensor training, pilot training, ground crew training. They do a variety of different training activities as well from Grand Sky. And that's our job is to make sure they have the tools they need to be able to do their business and conduct their business operations there. So that MQ-9 training program is pretty big. They do it for a lot of different customers. Uh, they even do it for some foreign military customers. And they bring them to Grand Forks, bring them to Grand Sky and conduct training there. So there's a, a lot of activity, but I think this Sky Range program will definitely add a lot to it. Um, we don't have the final plans yet, but it's not unreasonable to think that we're going to put 
a hundred thousand square feet or more of new hangars down. We're going to be putting some operation centers and offices and perhaps some laboratories for integration of new sensors in at Grand Sky. I have every reason to expect we may double in size in terms of total square footage developed. Tom, how long have you been with Grand Sky? I was part of its earliest inception. I had uh, quit a uh, company back in 2011 because we were just going in different directions. And a friend of mine who has a consulting business out of New Hampshire asked me to join him on a project in Grand Forks. I said, sure, I've never been to North Dakota. And lo and behold, we've created some great friendships and we've been a part of the Grand Sky Project since its very beginning. We have been the uh, exclusive developer since 2015. It's been a great, great run and we expect many more years of growth. Back, what were some of the biggest challenges? Oh, goodness, there were so many sleepless nights. There were so many times we sat there and said, is this really going to work? I mean, are people going to do this? Because when we conceived the project and made a proposal, you couldn't commercially fly unmanned aircraft legally. Uh, The FAA had not allowed that. The Part 107 program wasn't even out there. And so this was all individual COAs, all 331 exemptions to be able to fly UAS, and you weren't supposed to do it commercially. And so people are looking at us saying, how in the heck are you going to develop a drone airport around something that we can't do legally? We said, well, it's not going to be that way forever. And there were a lot of twists and turns. We had to do full-scale environmental permits. We had a number of consultations that we had to do with various stakeholders. We had to convince the Air Force to lease us the land. We had to convince the county to be a part of that lease. We had to develop this joint use agreement. All of which, these are millions of dollars in development effort before you ever put a single foot of pipe or a single bit of road or a single brick in the ground. It was a lot of work around that and a lot of risk of folks that had to write checks early on a little bit of a wing and a prayer that we were going to be able to achieve this. But we just kept working. You move on to the next problem. You solve that. You move to the next one and you solve that. And you move to the next one and you solve that with the ultimate goal in mind of this is what our vision is. And I will tell you, I woke up several times in the middle of the night saying, oh my God, this is never going to work. I can't believe we're doing it. This isn't going to work. Plus I had to convince my business partners that this was a sound investment for us to make because ultimately the state and the county said, well, this is great. We'll continue to invest, but you got to put some skin in the game too, which we did. And off we went and it just started working pretty quick from there. By June of 2016, we signed our leases in February of 2015. By June of 2016, Northrop Grumman had signed a lease and started construction on their building. So it took a little bit, but it got moving. What are you most proud of? Randy, that's a fabulous question. I would be lying if I didn't say I don't get a special feeling every time I see a drone take off and land whether it's an MQ-9 taxiing out to the runway or it's an MQ-9 doing pattern work or when Northrop Grumman brought their Firebird aircraft up, which I really love those aircraft. They brought those up for a week or a couple of weeks actually worth of testing and development work. Every time I see an aircraft go, I'm just, I just kind of have to pinch myself and say, wow, we, you know, this was the vision that we had. We wanted this to happen. People come in and work there every day to put in, get an aircraft ready to fly, fly their aircraft and land it safely. And it all happens at Grand Sky. So I'm really excited about that. And as we move forward, we've made the decision that if there is a job that can be done at Grand Sky with unmanned aircraft, we're going to do it with unmanned aircraft. So we have made investments in five Skydio XD2 small UAS that we're going to start doing all manner of pavement inspection, building and facility inspection, perimeter security inspection, look for wildlife out in the park uh, that may be a hazard to aircraft operations. We're going to be doing all of that with Skydio XD2 aircraft and maybe other aircraft in the future, but we're going to start doing a lot of the jobs. We're looking for aircraft and ground vehicles that can support our security efforts We're looking for pretty much any kind of aspect of what we can do with the UAS we want to do with the UAS out there. And so that's kind of our next step. Now, that's exciting. You're actually putting into practice many of the things that have been developed over the past several years. 
I think it has to kind of go that way. We can't just talk about, oh, we want to help other companies do this. We have to do it ourselves. So and another example is a relationship that we have with now with a, a contract with Mediomatics out of Switzerland and True Weather Solutions. We're going to put a weather drone into Grand Sky, and that's going to take time. We're going to have to work out the airspace issues and get COAs for flight over people and beyond line of sight and flight into known icing conditions. And those will all be firsts with respect to a weather drone. And we're going to deploy it at Grand Sky so that we can start to develop our own micro weather forecasting capability, which we think will add flight capability in the form of, well, maybe we won't scratch as much for perceived weather risk. We'll have a much more comprehensive and a much more dialed in weather forecast that will give our pilots and operators the opportunity to make better to go, no go decisions on flight ops. And so that's our long range plan. And we believe using drones to do weather measurement makes absolute sense. So we're going to do it. And so we entered in the contracts and hopefully we're going to be deploying that this fall. If someone is listening to this podcast and might wonder if Grand Sky is for them, what would you say? I would say that first, welcome, come on out, check out what we're doing there. Let's see how we can create the amenities that they might need to be able to uh, operate at Grand Sky. Uh, We have a lot of different ways that we can provide support, whether it's a maybe a three or four week sprint, or maybe it's a longer term development program that people want help with. We have a lot of great partners. Um, The Research Institute for Autonomous Systems at the University of North Dakota is a great group to work with and can provide additional resources just like the test site can. So we have an incredible ecosystem of pilots, of people that can help fix UAS, of people that can help us with generate the airspace needs. And then in addition, um, we're working with local farmers to make their farms available to companies that are interested in ag or companies that might be interested in infrastructure inspection or depending on what they want to do, we create the resources. So I would say just reach out. Let's talk about it. Let's figure out how it helps you the best and come up with the right testing, training, research, developmental solution that they might have. Tom, is there anything that we missed that we should talk about? The only things that we continue to kind of work on is how we are going to start integrating urban air mobility, advanced air mobility. Um, we're, we're working on that aspect of it right now and setting up perhaps a vertiport infrastructure capability around developing how is a vertiport really going to work. There are a lot of great plans and I've seen an incredible designs and futuristic visionary kinds of plans. But when I think about that and I think about the lessons learned we've had over you know, managing unmanned aircraft movement and unmanned aircraft operations at Grand Sky for the last six years, we have started to learn that it doesn't really work quite like that. And so how are we going to work with advanced air mobility? And so that's our one of our next big directions is we're going to install some sort of vertiport developmental capability where companies can come in and test out how their vertiport will work and how their plans for a vertiport. So for example, I think Skyports has got some great ideas. I thought Google had some great ideas and Uber Elevate had some great ideas and you see a lot of great programs out there. But then how are the aircraft really gonna move? And how are we really gonna get passengers back and forth? How are we really gonna manage stuff on the top of a building or the top of a parking garage and install that infrastructure retroactively? And once we install that infrastructure, how are we really going to launch and recover aircraft from that location, given predominant winds and things like that? And how are we going to create the safety programs that make it all work? Well, at Grand Sky, we can do all of that. We can do it right now. So we are headed in that direction. So that's, I think, important because that's our next big step. As a city planner, urban air mobility really intrigues me, especially in urban environments. From my perspective, Can it really offer a true mobility choice? And how might it change development patterns or transform a city? This is exactly what Grand Sky's, you know, true strength is. Infrastructure. You know, once the aircraft leaves the ground and is in the air safely, an FAA managed issue. But while it's sitting there on the ground, that's a community. That's the city of Houston or Chicago or Minneapolis or wherever needs to understand how these aircraft are going to interact within their urban environment 
And how are we going to charge those aircraft, assuming they're electric? What if they're not electric? How are we going to move fuel in and out, whether it's hydrogen fuel cell or it's avgas or something else? How are we going to move fuel up and down from the tops of buildings or parking garages? How are we going to move the power up and down and keep passengers safe from inclement weather? Or what happens when you only have a single landing pad and the check engine light on the aircraft comes on and it can't be moved? Is there a tug that moves that aircraft? How does it move? What happens when that landing pad is taken up and now I've got an aircraft coming in for a scheduled landing and I've got something that's you know broken down on the only landing pad? Those are all simple. They're not individually simple. They're very complex issues, but we can work through them. Again, kind of the way Grand Sky started, one step at a time, one issue at a time, solve this problem, solve this problem. And so we're making the investments and we're working with a bunch of partners, soon to be announced, hopefully, all these partnerships to create a Vertiport infrastructure test and evaluation capability. And for my final question, Tom, what message would you like to leave regarding the future of the drone industry? I think the future of the UAS industry is absolutely just incredible. I almost look at this as it's the next revolution to hit our broader world economy, much the way the internet did through the 90s and early 2000s. I think the UAS industry will have similar broad impact, particularly as we start to add autonomy into the systems and we all become much more comfortable with trusting autonomy with UAS systems, become more comfortable with uh, autonomous aircraft flying above us and around us, that's going to absolutely change so many things. It's going to change the way we understand our natural and built environments. It's going to help us change the way we see we're going to uh, generally ubiquitously start to have access to identical information. So for example, in a crop damage scenario, using a UAS lets the insurance company and the farmer have identical information about how much damage there really is. Instead of both coming up with a number and then negotiating it, we'll have an exact number. And that's capable, we can do that now, but now think about it when it's happening autonomously. And that's where I see a lot of this going and it's absolutely gonna change the way we collect data, understand data and create data which turns into actionable insights around our built and natural environments. And I, I'm really excited about how that's going to help change. That's it for episode 372 of the Drone Radio Show. I hope you enjoyed hearing from Tom Swoyer of the Grand Sky Development Organization. I want to thank Tom for taking the time to speak with me. If you want to learn more about Grand Sky or want to connect with Tom, check out the webpage at grandskynd.com. Register for the Commercial UAV Expo at expouav.com. Use code SAVE100 for a free Expo Hall Pass or $100 off the conference pass. If you like the Drone Radio Show, then you'll enjoy being part of the community of Drone Radio Show Advocates. I look forward to seeing you at patreon.com slash drone radio show. Check out the Patreon site for exclusive content now. And thanks for listening. Your support means a lot to me, and I hope you'll listen to more episodes of the Drone Radio Show podcast to hear how others are using drones for business, fun, and research. For the Drone Radio Show, I'm Randy Goers. This has been the Drone Radio Show podcast. More information on today's show can be found on our website at www.droneradioshow.com. If you're using drone technology for business, fun, or research, and would like to share your experience on the show, please visit our website and fill out a guest appearance application. And don't forget to follow us on your favorite social media channels.